Hey everyone, it's me, Miss Denny, your favorite children's librarian. Welcome to another edition of the Weekly Read. We have been reading The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, published in 1908. And the previous chapters are all right here on our YouTube page. Just look for the playlist, The Weekly Read, The Wind in the Willows. We're picking up today with chapter five, which is called Dulce Domo. Here we go. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air. As the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter and laughter. They were running across country after a long day's outing with otter hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams tributary, tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings and the shades of the short winter day were closing in on them. And they had still some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plow, they heard the sheep and made for them. And now leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking a lighter business and responded moreover to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, yes, quite right, this leads home. It looks as if we were coming to a village, said the mole, somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace as the track that had in time become a path and then had developed into a lane, now handed them over to the change of a well-metalled road. The animals did not hold with villages and their own highways, thickly frequented as they were, took an independent course, regardless of church, post office, or public house. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year, they're all safe indoors by this time. Sitting round the fire, men, women, and children, dogs and cats and all. We shall slip through all night without any bother or unpleasantness, and we can have a look at them through the windows if you like and see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of dusky orange red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low latticed windows were innocent of blinds, and to the lookers in from outside, the inmates gathered round the tea table absorbed in handiwork, talking with laughter and gesture, had each led with happy grace, which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture, the natural grace, which goes with the perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theater to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes as they watched a cat be stroked, or a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smoldering log. But it was from one little window with its blind drawn, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sons of home and the little curtained wall world within walls, the larger stressful world of outside nature shut out and forgotten, most pulsated. Close against the white blind hung a bird cage, clearly silhouetted, every wire perch and appurtenance distant and recognizable, even to yesterday's dull-edged lump of sugar. On the middle perch, the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into feathers, seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked, had they tried. Even the delicate tips of his plumped out plumage penciled plainly on the illuminated screen. As they looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself, and raised his head. They could see the gap, the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked around and settled his head back in again, while the ruffled feathers gradually subsided into perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleep on the skin woke them as from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold and their legs to be tired and their own home distant a weary way. Once beyond the village where the cottages ceased abruptly on either side of the road, they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again, and they braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end sometime in the rattle of the door latch, the sudden firelight, and the sight of familiar things greeting us as long absent travelers from far over sea. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper as it was pitch black. 
and all a strange country for him as far as he knew, and he was following obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the gray, straight gray road in front of him, so he did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. We others who have long lost the more subtle of the physical senses have not even proper terms to express an animal's intercommunications with his surroundings, living or otherwise. And we have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of the mysterious fairy calls from the out of the void that suddenly reached Mole in the darkness making him tingle through and through with, his, with its very familiar appeal, even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was. He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in the fullest flood. Home! That was what they meant, those caressing appeals, those soft touches that wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging in all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at that moment, his old home that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again, that day when he first found the river, and now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given it a thought. So absorbed had he been in his new life, in all its pleasures, its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, and small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home he had made for himself, the home he had been so happy to get back to after his day's work. And the home had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him and wanted him back and was telling him so through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with plaintive reminder that it was there and wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly and go. Ratty, he called, his voice full of joyful excitement. Hold on, come back, I want you quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleaded the poor mole in anguish of heart. You don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close. And I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty, please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice. And he was much taken up with the weather, too, for he could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. Mole, well, we mustn't stop now, really, he called back. We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you found. But I daren't stop now. It's late, and the snow's coming on again, and I'm not sure of the way. And I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick. There's a good fellow. And the rat pressed forward on his way without waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road, his heart torn asunder, and a big sob gathering, gathering somewhere low down inside him, to leap up to the surface presently, he knew in a passionate escape. But even under such a test as, his, as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile, the wafts of his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured, and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer within their magic circle. With a wrench that tore his very heart strings, he set face down the road and followed submissively in the track of the rat, while faint, thin little smells, still dogging his retreated nose, reproached him for his new friendship and for his callous forgetfulness. With an effort, he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they could do when they get back and how jolly a fire of logs in the parlor would be and what a supper he meant to eat never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, 
Look here, molly old chap, you seem dead tired. No talk left in you, your feet dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a minute and rest. The snow has held off so far and the best part of our journey is over. The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself for he felt it surely coming. The sob he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air and then another and another and others thick and fast till poor mole had at last gave up the struggle and cried freely and helplessly and openly now that he knew that it was all over and he had lost what he could hardly be said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's paroxysm of grief, did not dare speak for a while. At last he said very quietly and sympathetically, what is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter? Tell us your trouble and let me see what I can do. Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked on it as it came. I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, he sobbed forth at last brokenly, not like your cozy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or Badger's great house, but it was my own little home and I was fond of it. And I went away and forgot all about it. And then I smelt it suddenly on the road when I called and you wouldn't listen rat and everything came back to me with a rush and I wanted it, oh dear, oh dear. And when you wouldn't turn back ratty and I had to leave it, though I was smelling it all the time, I thought my heart would break. We might've just gone and had one look at it ratty, only one look, it was close by, but you wouldn't turn back ratty, you wouldn't turn back. Oh dear, oh dear. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow and sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time, he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been, a pig, that's me. Just a pig, a plain pig. He waited till Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till at last sniffs were frequent and sobs only intermittent. Then he rose from his seat and remarking carelessly, well, now we'd really better get, be getting on, old chap, set off on the road again over the toilsome way they had come. Wherever are you going to, ratty? cried the tearful mole, looking up in alarm. We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow, replied the rat pleasantly, so you had better come along for it will take some finding and we shall want your nose. Oh, come back, Ratty, do, cried the mole, getting up and hurrying after him. It's no good, I tell you. It's too late and too dark, and the place is too far off, and the snow's coming. And I, and I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. It was all an accident and a mistake. And, and think of your riverbank and supper. Hang riverbank and supper, too, said the rat heartily. I tell you, I'm going to find this place now if I stay out all night. So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm. We'll very soon be back there again. Still snuffling, pleading, and reluctant, Mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion, who by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote endeavored to beguile his spirits back and make the way, weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing that part of the road where the mole had been, held up, he said, now no more talking, business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for a little way, and then suddenly the rat was conscious. Through his arm was linked with moles, a faint sort of electric thrill was passing down that animal's body. Instantly, he disengaged himself, fell back a pace and waited all attention. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment rigid while his uplifted nose quivering slightly felt the air. Then a short, quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow, steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close to his heels as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on the alert and promptly followed him down the tunnel to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless and the earthy smell was strong and it seemed a long time to rat ere the passage ended and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. 
The mole struck a match and by its light, the rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was the mole's little front door with mole end painted in gothic lettering over the bell pole at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it. And the rat looking round him saw that they were in a sort of forecourt. Garden seats stood on one side of the door and on the other a roller for the mole who was a tidy animal when at home could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets with carrying plaster statuary. Garibaldi and the infant Samuel and Queen Victoria and other heroes of modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley with benches along it and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish and surrounded by a cockle shell border. Out of the center of the pond rose a fanciful erection clothed in more cockle shells and topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him, and he hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall, and took one glance round his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of the long-neglected house, with its narrow, meager dimensions, its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, Ratty, he cried dismally, why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at the riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire, with all your nice things about you? The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, expect, inspecting rooms and cupboards and lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he called out cheerily. So compact, so well planned. Everything here and everything in its place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlor? Splendid. Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital. I'll fetch the wood and the coals and you get a duster, mole, and you'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table and try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and hardiness, while the rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a blazing roar in the chimney. He hailed the mole to come and warm himself, but the mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in his duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I have nothing to give you, nothing but a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser quite distinctly, and everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in the neighborhood. Rouse yourself, pull yourself together and come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer. The result was not so very depressing after all, though of course it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. There's a banquet for you, observed the rat as he arranged the table. I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight. No bread, groaned the mole dolorously. No butter, no, no pâté de foie gras, no champagne, continued the rat, grinning. And that reminds me, what's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course, every luxury in this house. Just you wait a minute. He made for the cellar door and presently reappeared, somewhat dusty, with a bottle of beer in each paw and under each arm. Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mole, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Now, wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the home place look so homelike they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it and how you came to make it what it is. Then, while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks and mustard, which he mixed in an egg cup, the mole, his, his bosom still heaving with the stress of his recent emotion, related, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, 
how this was planned and how that was thought out and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt and that was a wonderful find and a bargain. And this other thing was brought, bought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally quite restored, he, he must needs go and caress his possessions and take a lamp and show off their points to his visitor and expatiate on them, quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed. Rat, who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it, nodded seriously, examining with a puckered brow and saying, wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given him. At last, the rat succeeded in decoying him to the table and had just got seriously to work with the sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt without. Sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel and a confused murmur of tiny voices while broken sentences reached them. Now all in a line, hold the lantern up a bit, Tommy, and clear your throats first. No coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill? Here, come on, do. We're all awaiting. What's up? inquired the rat, pausing in his labors. I think it must be the field mice, replied the mole with a touch of pride in his manner. They go around carol singing regularly at this time of year. They're quite an institution in these parts and they never pass me over. They come to mole and last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks and supper too sometimes when I could afford it. It will be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, court, lit by dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red worsted comforters around their throats, their forepaws thrust deep in their pockets, their feet jiggling for warmth. With bright, steady eyes, they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little, sniffing and applying coat sleeves a great deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old time carols that their forefathers composed in the fields that were fallow and held by frost, and when snowbound in chimney corners and handed down to be sung in the miry street to lamp lit windows at Yule time. Here's their carol. Villagers all this frosty tide, let your doors swing open wide. Through wind, the wind may follow and snow beside, yet draw us in by your fire to bide. Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in the cold and the sleep, blowing fingers and stamping feet. Come from far away you to greet, you by the fire and we in the street, bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half of night was gone, sudden a star has led us on. Raining bliss and venison, bliss tomorrow and more anon, joy for every morning. Goodman Joseph toiled through the snow, saw the star o'er a stable low, Mary she might not further go, welcome thatch and litter below, joy was, joy was hers in the morning. And when they heard the angels tell, who were the first to cry Noel? Animals all as it befell in the stable where they did dwell, joy shall be theirs in the morning. Their voices ceased, the singers, bashful but smiling, exchanged sidelong glances, and silence succeeded, but only for a moment. Then, from up above and far away, down the tunnel they had so lately traveled, was borne to their ears, in a faint musical hum, the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful and clangorous peal. Very well sung, boys, cried the rat heartily. Now come along in, all of you, and warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot. Yes, come along, field mice, cried the mole eagerly. This is quite like old times. Shut the door after you, hold up, settle up to the fire. Now you just wait a minute while we, oh, ratty, he cried in despair, plumping down on a seat with tears impending. Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them. You leave all that to me, cried the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern, come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, said the field mouse respectfully. At this time of year, our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. And look here, said the rat, you go off at once and you, you and your lantern and you get me. Here much muttered conversation enthused and the mole only heard bits of it, such as fresh mind, no, a pound of that will do. See, you get for buggins for I won't have any other. Now only the best if you can't get it there. 
Try somewhere else. Yes, of course, a homemade, no tin stuffed. Well, then do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to the enjoyment of the fire and toasted their chillbanes while they tingled, while the mole falling, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out caroling this year, but looked forward to very shortly winning parental consent. consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mole some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater into the well-read heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mold ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. The act plays too for these fellows, the mole explained to the rat. Make them up all by themselves and act them afterwards, and very well they do it too. They gave us a capital one last year about a field mouse who was captured at sea by a Barbary corsair and made to, grow, made to row in a galley and then he escaped and go, go, got home again. His lady love had gone into a convent. Here you, you were in it, I remember. Get up and recite a bit. The field mouse addressed got up on his legs, giggled shyly and looked around the room and remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on. Mole coaxed and encouraged him and the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him, but nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulation to a case of long submersion. When the latch clicked and the door opened and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out on the table. Under the generalship of Rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In very few minutes, supper was ready and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savory comforts, saw his little friend's faces brighten and beam as they fell to without delay, and that let himself loose for he was famished indeed. On the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy come homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date and answered as well as they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing, only taking care that each guest had what he wanted and plenty of it and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful and showering wishes of the season with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked up the fire, drew their chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of the long day. At last, the Rat, with a tremendous yawn, ooh, said, Mole, old chap, uh, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, then, I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is, everything so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well in the blankets and slumber gathered him forthwith as a swath of barley is folded into the arms of the reaping machine. The weary mole who was also glad to turn in without delay and soon had his head on the pillow in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now seemingly received him back without rancor. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it was, it all was, but clearly too how much it all meant to him and the special value of such anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon the new life and its splendid spaces, to turn his back on sun and air and all they offered him and creep home and stay there. 
The upper world was all too strong. It called to him, still, even down there, and he knew he must return to the larger stage. But it was good to think he had this to come back to, this place that was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. We'll stop there for today, and we'll pick up again next time with Chapter 6, which is called Mr. Toad. Thank you so much for joining me, friends. See you soon.